My name is Chad Jones. I'm the Director of Public Affairs here. Thank you all for coming to our town hall regarding access control procedures here on the fort with Colonel Brian Foley. Um, just wanted to go over a few things before we get started. This is one of several means that we'll be using or have used to put out the information. Uh, we have our weekly sound off newspaper. We've been putting it online. We've been putting it out in customer service areas and on uh, April 31st, we will be having a an eight-page insert getting into more of the details of what the uh, new procedures are to, to go along with this event. Um, before I hand it off to Colonel Foley, just a couple of things if you could please do. If you could please turn off your cell phone, phone or put it to vibrate. I uh, want to let you know this meeting is being recorded with the intention that we'll be putting it on our YouTube channel tomorrow and the, the full version will probably be up on Monday, but everything we do say and all the responses and all your questions will be on the record uh, for uh, public consumption. Uh, the questions will be taken after Colonel Foley is done with his uh, presentation. And if you do have any questions, I think with the size of the audience we have here, uh, you should just be able to stand up and ask your question, but we can also run you up a microphone. Uh, if we need to and just you know small smaller crowd garrison commander here I know there's a lot of issues we could get on to but today uh, the, the topic uh, is the upcoming access control procedures so if we could please keep comments and questions to that topic and keep the conversation respectable I think we'll have a productive evening so again thank you and with that, Garrison Commander Colonel Brian Foley. Okay, thank you, Chad. And uh, welcome to everyone who's uh, here this evening and spent some time with us. So, um, yeah, appreciate you coming out, and we will do our best to get all of your questions answered here tonight and hopefully uh, alleviate uh, uh, any unneeded fears that you may have. So, um, on the 4th of April, we will be... Uh, implementing what is the final measure uh, of a series of uh, requirements and measures that the Army has directed all Army installations to take uh, globally in terms of access control enhanced or increased access control procedures uh, to make sure that all that are coming on our Army installations uh, have been vetted appropriately and have a valid reason to be on our forts. So again, this is a result of uh, Army-wide requirements and standards. It's not a Fort Meade uh, initiative. Uh, it's not a you know, Colonel Foley initiative. It's Colonel Foley complying with Army standards. And uh, the Army's timeline for full implementation of all of these standards is uh, actually 30 September of this year. Um, but we had to back that implementation timeline up to April uh, because the system that we have been using to vet guests onto the installation uh, uh, expires and cannot be renewed because it's not an Army standard system and it expires in April. So we had to back that timeline up uh, to implement the final step on the 4th of April. Uh, on the 4th of April, we are, we are only, there's only one change that is occurring that's different than the way we are already doing business. We have been implementing the Army standards and measures over the course of the past six to seven months gradually. So it's been a gradual implementation and this final step uh, we now are taking again on the fourth. That step is simply that um, the, the standard, the requirement is all short-term guests, not just long-term guests, guests that are coming on this installation for less than 24 hours just for a, you know, a couple hour visit or to do uh, business, to drop off a pizza, uh, those types of short-term guests must be issued a actual access pass to the installation. So a piece of paper that says this is why they're coming on the installation, this is who they're coming to see, and, uh, and for what purpose. And then those people uh, are, are vetted. We are already vetting the non-DOD affiliated personnel that are coming on the installation today. We're just not issuing the passes. The system that we're using to do the background checks on them 
is the non-Army standard system, and it's a system that cannot issue passes. Uh, so we have to revert to the system that does issue those passes, and, uh, and that's what we're doing on the 4th. That system is the automated installation entry system. Uh, it is the system that we've seen over the past three, four months being installed at the, uh, uh, the access lanes uh, on to posts. So those of us that, that have access to the installation already through uh, the, the valid forms of identification that we use to enter, uh, we're now swiping you know, those cards through AIE. Uh, AIE is a, it's an associated but separate effort from what we're talking about tonight, which is this final issuance of, pa of a pass for the temporary guests. Um, uh, but it is AIE that has to be used to issue those passes, and the passes can only be issued from inside the visitor control center. So now we get to the, the guts of the change that takes effect on the 4th. On the 4th of April, uh, to get a temporary pass to come on the installation, you're going to have to go inside the visitor control center to get that pass. So guests will now be routed into the VCC to wait in line uh, to, uh, to either get vetted if they have not been pre-vetted uh, or to pick up uh, the access pass if they have been pre-vetted. The visitor control center, we are expanding the hours of operation for the visitor control center uh, as to open, to remain open as long as we possibly can within the limitations of personnel that we have, that we are authorized uh, to have on the installation. So based on the limitations of personnel, <coughs> workers in the visitor control center, uh, the VCC will be open from 0730 in the morning until 9 p.m. at night, 2100, Monday through Friday. And it will not be open uh, on weekends or from you know, 9 o'clock at night until 0730 in the morning. So if a guest wants or needs to come on this installation during those hours when the VCC is not open, they will either have to have been pre-vetted, cleared ahead of time. If they have been cleared ahead of time, the access pass that will have been processed for them will be waiting for them at the inspection lane, as is current procedure. A pizza delivery guy wants to come on a Saturday night, he goes to the visitor control lane to get on the installation. Uh, that, uh, if that delivery uh, person has been pre-vetted, as all of the local vendors in the region have been notified also of this new process, so they should all be getting their employees vetted ahead of time, uh, then that employee will either have, you know, if it's a first time coming on for that employee and they've been pre-vetted, there should be a pass waiting for them at the uh, inspection lane. Uh, same goes for any guests that we may want to bring on the installation as residents that are currently living here or as workers that are currently here. Uh, if we have pre-vetted our family members uh, ahead of time uh, and they're going to show up on a Saturday or Sunday, then they, the pass will be waiting for them at the inspection lane. If for some reason um, we, you know, it's a no notice, you didn't know, your, your friends just happened to show up in town and you didn't know they were coming and it's a Saturday afternoon and uh, they show up at Fort Meade, they will be routed to the, uh, vi you know, the visitor lane where they currently have to go to anyway. But the, the big change and it's going to behoove, you know, the responsibility of us all is uh, guests that have not been pre-vetted will not be allowed on the installation unless they call and you as the sponsor of the guest are, are here and willing and able to get out to the gate to then escort them in and on to the installation. Um, and then you are taking responsibility for you know, your guest while they're here on the installation. So there is no other changes taking effect. The Trusted Traveler program that currently exists uh, that allows those of us with DID, DOD ID cards who already have uh, uh, DOD ID cards in our spouses uh, to serve as trusted agents for visitors or guests that are in our, in our vehicles uh, to, to go through and, and you know, do the on-the-spot sponsorship for those people. <coughs> trusted Traveler, no change to that existing <coughs> program. Same concept as the escort program. If uh, you have to escort a, uh, you know, a 
a TV repair person onto the installation also and you're responsible for ensuring that a TV repair person gets to your house and then gets back out off the installation uh, at, once they're done doing the work. Um, but there uh, are no other changes to the processes and procedures. Any resident on this installation today, anyone that today has any form of badge or pass that allows you uh, to not have to get your vehicle inspected every time you come on this installation, you can be a sponsor for a guest on this installation. So we had the concern about uh, DOD contractors who live on post um, in Corvius housing uh, or, or spouses of DOD civilians who live on the installation. Spouses of DOD civilians, spouses of contractors don't have any kind of DOD identification card, but they do, they, you know, if you're living on the installation legally uh, with your spouse who's a contractor or a DOD civilian, you should have a annual resident access pass that's already been issued to you. So you don't have to go through and get your vehicle inspected every time you come on the post. That pass is also valid for you to sponsor. We understand that contractors and DOD civilians can have to go TDY or be gone for periods of time and you may be uh, alone. We want to be as proactive as we possibly can to pre-vet and pre-sponsor as many of our friends or relatives as we can think of who might have a need to come on the installation and help us out at some point in the future. Um, you know, so you can, so we can preclude that you from having to go to the, to the uh, visitor inspection lane on a Saturday afternoon to pick them up and bring them on, or to preclude them from having to, you know, to wait in a very long line if they show up at the visitor control center when it's open during the, the, the duty week. So to walk you through the, the process as an example of what I am going to have to do uh, here next week, uh, because my parents are coming back for a, a visit for a couple days in uh, the middle of April, and so next week, I am going to go to the visitor control center, uh, wait in line. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, with the, uh, my parents' driver's license numbers and their social security numbers and their birth dates. Um, does not necessarily have to be driver's license and social security number, but it has to be two identifying numbers from any of 12 uh, forms of identification that pass the DOD, uh, the federal government's Real ID Act. And we have the list of all of those types of identification readily available and we can uh, uh, hand them out. But you go with those with those numbers, you don't need photocopies, you don't need uh, the actual copies themselves, you just need the information, the numbers. You go, you fill out the form, you put the numbers on the form, um, and then you, you wait in line and you hand the form to the, to the uh, employee at our visitor control center. They take the form, you show your identification that proves that you're a valid sponsor, either a resident on this installation or uh, you work on this installation. And then, and then the uh, uh, employee takes that. We're saying uh, we'll, we'll make a guarantee that if you get that form to us 10 working days, so two calendar weeks ahead of time from when that visitor is going to be on the installation, we'll have the pass ready. If you're inside that window, we'll make no guarantee that it's going to be ready on the date that they show up. So we're asking, based on, again, the number of employees that we have, for 10 working days, uh, advance notice. And then the pass will be waiting. So then, if your guests show up onto the, uh, uh, at, at the main gate during the duty hours when the visitor control center is open, they will go inside the visitor control center. Um, we will have a, uh, a separate lane for the uh, passes who are waiting to, to pick up. So kind of like TSA where uh, you can kind of go to the front of the line and wait if you're an employee of TSA or if you're a DOD ID card holder, active duty military. You don't have to wait in the, in the long line of people that are just waiting to show their ID and gate pass at, uh, at TSA. Um, so the TSA employee, our VCC employee, will be, you know, the next time they're done with the person they're at, if there's a person waiting in the pickup line, they'll turn to that person next. They'll check that person's ID, proving, of course, who they are. They are who they say they are. Flip through, get the pass, here you go, sir, ma'am, thank you for uh, coming on to Fort Meade. And then that person can come on and go through the standard visitor uh, access lane, get their vehicle, uh, just get their vehicle checked, and, uh, and be able to 
come on the installation. So then the same procedures is there from, uh, from then on. So uh, that's, and then if the person, the guest shows up when the VCC is closed after duty hours, the passes will be waiting for them at the inspection lane. So just go to the inspection lane if they come on a Saturday or Sunday and the pass will be there for them. Again, assuming that the vetting was done 10 duty days, uh, 10 working days in advance. So again, it's, it's the you know, pre-vet, pre-vet, pre-vet is the theme we want to encourage all too. If you know you have friends, relatives, guests, uh, we have friends that are non-DOD affiliated that live in Alexandria that come and visit us and have dinner with us about once a month. Same thing, we're gonna pre-vet them. You can, you can clear someone for up to 12 months. So if you know you have a family member or, or friend who's gonna you know, periodically come on the installation and visit you, you don't, have to get, you don't have to do this process every time. You can request a 12 month pass for your friends or relatives to come on the installation. So it really is, you know, we, have, we also, you know, we have the resident concern and, uh, and then we have the, you know, the, uh, uh, those that are coming on for business purposes for, you know, the one-time job fairs, the events that we sponsor um, where, you know, if they're just coming on one time, again, we're our own staff. We're, you know, we're working to make sure that we get the advance notice out to those that are come on so we can pre-vet as many of those folks as possible. Uh, but those, for whatever reason, that aren't able to pre-vet will have to wait in line at the Visitor Control Center uh, until they can provide their information and have the background check run on them. Um, so it is, again, it's about vetting everyone against the NCIC, III, Federal, FBI database to make sure that the people coming on the installation uh, are, again, people that are, don't have criminal backgrounds or criminal records. If the person you are trying to sponsor onto the installation does come up with some kind of a background uh, issue um, that you may not even have been aware of. <laughs> um, and it is you know, one of a list of criteria, such as you know, you've, you've been convicted in the past of a federal crime, uh, then there, there is a, uh, a request for exception to policy process that, that uh, uh, will then be implemented. So we'll contact you, of course, if you're the sponsor, to let you know, hey, this person you know, has, has uh, come up you know, with this issue in their background. Do you still want to sponsor this person on the installation? Uh, and if so, um, the waiver process, which would come to my desk as the garrison commander, the responsible party for everything that goes on this installation, uh, it's then my call. And I look at what that person did, how long ago did it occur, um, and, uh, and whether or not I'm comfortable with allowing that person to come on the installation today. And that's happened twice now through the current procedures that we already have. It's the same as you know, we already do. If someone wants to get a long-term access pass on the installation, they go through the same vetting process. And uh, uh, you know, for Corbius residents is, is you know, what, it, what it is. And it's twice so far, and I've favorably adjudicated one time, and I've unfavorably adjudicated one time. So um, you know, literally, you know, we had a person that requesting access onto this installation who had been federally convicted of terrorism. And um, you know, so I'm a reformed terrorist. Can I, you know, can I come on for me now? Well, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not really comfortable with you claiming that you're a reformed terrorist. Um, so the other person, it was a relatively minor incident, you know, happened, you know, 20 years earlier, and and uh, you know, as, as confident as you possibly can be that uh, this you know this person is safe now to come on the installation and be vetted. So again, it is you know, this is all about just ensuring that you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, the safety and welfare of all of us as a community and that the, you know, the people that are coming on the installation are uh, the right people, the people that we want on the, on the installation today. Um, so I'll just talk through um, one more scenario and then I think I've hit on all of the key elements of, of this, but uh, the other scenario that's gonna, you know, potentially cause a change in how we're doing business today is I'm a resident on Fort Meade today. Um, uh, I just called uh, to, uh, to pick up a pizza at Gianni's and uh, it's, a, uh, it's a Saturday evening and I'm uh, alone in my house. My wife is you know, visiting her relatives with, uh, with my son and uh, I took off and I drove up to Gianni's on 175 and I get to Gianni's and realize that I forgot my wallet in my quarters and I don't have my ID or any form of identification at all, 
And uh, so, first of all, um, you know, I'm friends with, uh, with Gianni's, but uh, they're not going to give me a pizza for free. So I have to turn around at that point now and drive uh, to the visitor access lane because I no longer have any ID to prove who I am. And uh, if I'm fortunate enough that my wife is not gone and she is in the residence, then the guards will call or I will call and ask my wife to bring my identification you know, card up to the visitor gate and then I'll be able to prove myself there. If there is nobody in the house, and I'm truly, I don't, there's nobody else I can think of to call who lives on the installation who can you know, get my ID card for me and bring it to me, uh, yes, I will have to wait there and we will send a patrol car to you. Next available patrol car that comes around, we're not going to guarantee that we're going to have a patrol car there in five minutes. You may have to wait a little while until we have an available patrol car, but we will send a patrol car to the gate to escort you, not to get in your car, you don't have to get in the cop car, but just to follow you and your car to your residence and then wait there while you go into your house, get your wallet, come back out and show the police officer that you, you, know, you are indeed Colonel Brian Fuller. Um, so that's you know, the process that we're going to have to uh, you know, start to uh, more clearly enforce and, as we move forward. So let me just check my notes to make sure I haven't missed any key elements here. Nope, I think I got it all. So we'll open it up for questions here in just a minute, but again, I just, again, want to thank the entire community, uh, request everyone's patience uh, and understanding as we go through this process. What we don't know right now today is how long the lines are going to be at the Visitor Control Center on the 5th of April or on the 4th of April when we start this. So undoubtedly there will be some frustration. Uh, there will be long lines for at least a period of time at the uh, Visitor Control Center. So behoove you all to you know, start now, uh, head, head out to the VCC next week. If you know you have routine guests that, are, that uh, come on the installation frequently, uh, try to get their identification now so we can get them pre-vetted um, if you know they're coming on. And uh, just you know, bear with us. This is all about cooperation and partnership with the community as everything that, uh, that happens on this installation is about. Um, and again, you know, safety and security on this, on this installation, it's all of our business. Everyone that's a member of this community, whether you're a, a worker here or a resident here or both, it is our collective responsibility to keep this place safe and secure. We do not have enough police officers. We do not have enough security guards. Um, uh, we do not have enough MPs to rely solely on law enforcement professionals to keep us safe. We, each and every one of us, has to embrace the if you see something, say something mindset. Uh, so if you see a person that looks out of place, that you're not sure, you know, if they look disturbed for some reason or out of place for some reason, then err on the side of caution. That's okay. You know, call 911 and we will send a patrol car over to the area to, you know, to double check to make sure that person, you know, is truly okay and has a valid reason to be on the installation. Um, so we thank you for your partnership in this effort. Thank and you, uh, uh, Chad. One point of yep. clarification on when, you, when the individual goes to the VCC, what identification they need to bring with them. Yes, sir. The discussion had been, do I need to have two forms of original ID? Oh, sorry. Does the sponsor, is the question, does the sponsor, when I go to the VCC to fill out the paperwork for my, to, for my parents to come on the installation, do I have to have two forms of ID to prove who I am? Yes. As a sponsor. Yes, as a sponsor. The reason, sir, is that we are validating that you are indeed the person who is asking to have this happen. We have had individuals who tried to present themselves as sponsors, in, as, in, uh, as valid sponsors who were not valid. The, dis the question was, do I need to have two original forms of ID? The answer to that is no. You can have one form of original ID, primary ID, and in essence, it's something that has your photo and biographical information on it. ID, a driver's license, uh, passport, 
couple other forms, DOD ID card. The second form of ID, because what we're going to do is we are going to vet the, the uh, request store. We are going to run the requester to ensure that they are still indeed valid and legitimate in order to ask to be a sponsor. So that's why we do that. So I can have my driver's license and a copy of like my social security card, uh, there's a other card, and these, these forms of ID will be listed on the web. So questions about hey, what constitutes a valid type of ID card will be posted on the web with the link, and it will give you literally A, B, C, and D. I'll show you, this is primary, this is secondary. The reason being is that we are literally validating the requester to ensure they, they do indeed still possess the nexus and the valid uh, reason and the ability to request sponsorship. Today, and for the you know, near future at least, sponsors are going to have to go physically to the VCC to fill out you know, a hard copy form. We will seek to automate this process in the future you know, through a web-based registration uh, mechanism. But in the meantime, you know, we're, we're not there technologically yet. So in the meantime, yes, we as sponsors are going to have to go to fill out the registration. As sponsors, once you've done that, you've, you've done your pre-vetting, you don't have to go back again. If, you, if your guest has been pre-vetted and the pass is there, you don't have to go back again. Your, your guest can then come on uh, by just getting the pass that should be waiting for them and coming on the installation. Yes, sir. And the Good question. The, guest, the same yeah. thing with the guest when you're picking up. So just look at it as two and two. The requester, I need two forms of ID, one original, one can be a photocopy. The, set, the person who's picking up the badges, the second one, picking up the badges, two forms of ID, one primary, you know, again, something that's like a driver's license, got a picture ID on it, biographical information. So that way, we are validating one, the request door, and two, we are validating the individual who is coming through. So this is a this is an enhanced safety because literally, we have had people, again, who have tried to circumvent the system and gain access where otherwise they would not have been allowed. And also falsely uh, represent somebody saying, oh yeah, this person absolutely didn't get it. And no, not true. So because of that situation, we are ensuring your safety and security for everyone who moves on this installation, making sure someone is not trying to circumvent the security procedures. All right. Questions? First, pink shirt. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I have a question. I got in late. Did you talk about the age of children that need to be vetted? I'm a resident and I have minor children. Do they need to go to do I need to take them to get a um... No, again there are there are no there are no changes to the current access to this installation other than uh, guests for guests who are not already residents uh, on this installation. If your children are, are minors um, and you did not have to register them as, as you know, guests today, if you don't have to register them as guests today, if they don't have to go through the VCC and show a, a form of identification today, they're not going to have to on the 4th of April either. Is he driving? Uh, no, he'll be in the back. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Ask. Well, yes, ma'am. The reason being is 18, under the age of 18, so 17 and younger, do not have to show ID, nor do they have to be screened against your blood. 18 and older do. What is possible, as, as your young man is, is maturing, that they no longer look, you know, that young 16-year-old. So it's based off of visual recognition. I think this person's over the age of 18. So right, so the FBI background check, the NCIC triple I background check, that we're all guests today are being vetted uh, against the background check. We're just not issuing temporary passes today, and that's what changes on the 4th of April. We have to issue temporary passes beginning on the 4th of April. But uh, so the, the, the cutoff age is 18. If you're 18 years or older, you have to be vetted against the FBI uh, database. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm going to go uh, next to your man. No, uh, no, no, no limit. Now, now, Corbius does have a, a separate and associated set of, uh, uh, you know, who can be, how many people you can have living with you in your quarters. Um, so Corbius does have their own rules about, about you know, uh, long-term guests having to be registered with Corvius as long-term residents also. So I, I think it's 30 days or more. If you're going to have a permanent, your, your, your elderly parents are going to come live with you now, um, you know, indefinitely, permanently, they have to be registered. If it's uh, three weeks, they don't have to be registered. Um, so there's no limit on the numbers other than, of course, you know, whatever the appropriate number, you know, of people that should be living in a home of, you know, a particular size is. So. Yeah, but not no. There's no limit to the number of visitors <coughs> you can have. It's just as long as the the uh, the purpose is a valid uh, reason to come on. And and any of us that you know are currently work here or uh, live here today uh, can sponsor someone to come on the installation. Uh, where we come into the change is when you have a you know Joe private citizen shows up at the gate. They don't know anyone that lives or works on Fort Meade. And they just say, hey, I'm a U.S. taxpayer and I want to go drive around to see what my U.S. taxpayer dollars are paying for. Um, that today no longer constitutes a valid reason uh, to come on the installation unless you submit the request and it will have to come up to me and I'll have to you know, adjudicate whether uh, this private citizen has a valid reason to come on to the installation today. Uh, if you want to go to see the museum and you're a U.S. taxpayer, that's a valid reason to come on the installation, but I would just have to see it, chop off on it, and, and, uh, and approve. Um, if you don't know anyone else that lives or works on the installation uh, who can get you on and you want to go to the museum. Uh, people coming by, you spoke earlier about people coming by bus. Yep. That, that conversation stemmed on commercial buses. Yep. I mean the uh, regional transit. Authority. You, uh, I understand there is also a a, a 14 shuttle run um, between here and the old, which you know, that's what schedules as it comes inside. Is that schedule going to continue to, to be? Is this a uh, military vehicle? Is this a commercial vehicle? Those are not. Yeah, those are military uh, owned and sponsored shuttle buses, and the people that get on those buses are all vetted when they get on those buses. There are, there are, um, there are three interior shuttle systems on this installation uh, with, that are operated and maintained by different partner uh, organizations that are, re that are uh, stationed on Fort Meade. There is an NSA shuttle, uh, there is a, um, a uh, DINFOS DMA shuttle, and there is a shuttle that's operated by our uh, Logistics Readiness Center uh, and folks. that shuttle there would be different than the one that you described earlier that picks up at the visitor center? Yes. So if somebody, if for example now, I asked you about uh, the new proposed express service that comes from Annapolis and Ten Island, if they came and stopped at the Mark Rail, Rail Station and used that as a transfer point for convenience of those buses, would that be, in your opinion, a viable transfer point for that? Yeah, the bus drivers are DOD employees who are responsible for vetting and ensuring that every uh, person who gets on. They are, they are DOD employees, and they should be responsible for vetting every person that comes on the installation. So it can be an NSA DOD employee. There is not one person on those buses who does not possess a DOD ID card or a Fort Meade generated access credential. No one on that bus is not affiliated. They're not allowed the, on that the bus. The point is you have to get vetted at that point because that bus is then going to, 
is so that someone does not become a frustrated cargo and get kicked off the bus so at if, if, the if Reese everybody gate. Everybody that gets on that bus over the Overton or the other Marsh station has, you know, clear as a kind of pack cars like that. Will they come right straight to the, to the gate here again when they come? All buses are searched, sir. Pardon? All buses are searched. So the person on a commercial vehicle or a large capacity vehicle is validated with ID and the vehicle is inspected. But there's no change to that. That's the existing way we're doing it today. All just with that. We have not read in the bus. So yeah, so there's no, no change to the existing shuttles today, the three shuttle systems that, uh, that run, that are DOD operated and maintained, there'll be no change to those procedures that are currently going on today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question. You're next. Yes. Uh, this handout uh, depicts a security guard welcoming a car at the electronic the terminal there. Is this uh, going to be expected of individuals or the security guard? Uh, so the automated installation entry system um, is uh, intended to enable uh, drivers to be able to swipe their card uh, underneath the scanner. Um, if for some, but but the system is not intended to replace human beings uh, out of the net. So. Um, there is a camera system there uh, and was proved to me this morning. I dropped my wife up at the airport at 4.30. I came back in the gate. I swiped my card under the scanner. There was no guard there. Uh, and the security guard on the inside of the guard shack opened the door and said, good morning, sir. Welcome, welcome to Fort Meade. He was able to see my face through the camera system that AIE has to know that it was Colonel Foley coming back on the installation. So there are cameras there, even though you, don't, you may not see the person. If, for some reason, you, you, know, you don't get close enough to the terminal, and you reach out and you can't reach it, or it's the first time doing it, and you're trying to figure out which way to point the card, um, the guards will come out and help you and assist you and swipe the card for you. So guards will always be present at the gates to assist uh, you know, folks that are having a tough time, for whatever reason, uh, swiping that card. The reason I ask this question, uh, I'm a Monday morning senior voter with some uh, 85 to 90 year olds, and they've expressed uh, a wee bit of a problem having to, to reach this uh, terminal thing there, right? And she is one of them, my wife. And so uh, I'm just looking out for these people who are responsible for some of us being here. You know, they've been around here for. 50, 60 years. Yep. And so, you know, let's not be cruel to them. And if the guard will have no problem of saying, I'll swipe the card for you, well and good. And the guard will not. Thank you. And if you ever bump into a guard that has a problem with that, then please let uh, him know and me know, and we'll take care of that guard. Thank you. <laughs> Next. Here. We had a question here. Sir, I want, I want to clarify something. Uh, you mentioned that the residents will be able to get a 12-month pass for relatives or friends. Um, that's something new, and I think that goes into what the lady in the back was saying, that in the past she was not able to get a 12-month pass, for example, for her mom that comes twice a week or three times a week to pick up a child or something like that. I just want to make sure that that is correct. And, is there is anything required from the resident to take to the VCC to be able to get that home pass for a relative or a friend that do not live here but comes to the post often enough that we need a pass? Yeah, that's the process I just explained, right? Okay, so, so they don't need anything specific like a lease or anything like that? No. Two forms of, two forms of identification and, and... Sir, can I clarify that? Yeah. The, resident, the resident program is different and independent from the guest visitor program. The lease is required because we need to know that you are, because as a resident, I am requesting residential things, and we need to know the term of lease, and that you are actually the person on the lease. So for example, not saying names, somebody showed up, oh yeah, I'm a resident, I live in blah, 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 and I'm gonna sponsor this person on for a year. Well, guess what, they weren't. 
blah, 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 living on Fort Meade, and they were trying to sponsor somebody on San Diego Resident. So the residential program has that additional piece to it, two forms of ID and your lease because I'm a resident, because we will only grant that pass for mom, dad, or whoever for the term of the lease. So if your lease is up in three months and I want a year-long pass for mom, no. Commissioner. Thank you. So bring the lease, so the, the, so the, so residents bring the lease with you. So that means that I am also going to have to bring my lease with me along with two forms of identification when I go to the VCC to register my parents one time yes, sir. Uh, because I'm not going to go back and do this every single time that they come to visit. No, sir. You do it once. The thing to remember is that if you just comply initially, it's so easy. You just comply. And after that, it goes through. You either have the long-term badge or you're pre-vetted and you're pre-registered. So the, easy, the thing to remember here is instead of, you know, don't, don't fight the program, don't fight the system. Just do that. And the checks and balances we have, the residential thing is because people have tried to use the system and sponsor people longer than the term of their lease. We can't have that. And so that's for their safety and protection as well. So you have the residential system that's in concert with Corvius. You have the sponsorship program that is independent of Corvius. And then you have you know, the guest, I'm just coming on here and I want to try to come on the installation because I want to. And it's trusted traffic. I'm trying to understand. Um, you know, I've had a situation where I forgot my first husband had an ID card. But he went in and left me at a store to go get my first so we could do the 100% check. But now with these automated machines, you're saying that he would not need to run and get my first to prove under 100% ID check what I am because I'm a trusted traveler and I'm with him. And I'm wondering. To coincide with that, yes, he's a military person and I'm his spouse. Are, are passengers going to be allowed, say, pizza delivery? Or something to free that? That's the security concern. That I have. No, uh, uh, trusted I traveler know. is only for the DOD ID card holding person or their spouse. So the, the person that can serve as the trustee is limited under the trusted traveler program to the, the primary DOD ID card holder and uh, one spouse, you know, one, one spouse. So, so a non-DOD person can't have just a car full of Right. The, the, the pizza delivery guy that just had, he's been pre-vetted, he's got his, uh, his pass that's good for a year. He is not, cannot serve as a trusted traveler. Contractors cannot serve as trusted travelers. So you can't have a contractor with a load of, you know, 12 painters in the back of the van the, that, that contractor cannot serve as a trusted traveler. There's got to be a DOD ID card holding person that is the person, you know, being the trustee, the responsible agent for the people that are in the back of the vehicle. Sir, for 100% ID check, just to let you know, there are things that are called random anti terrorism measures. The first word being random. They can and will require 100% ID proofing of individuals in the car. We may not do it all the time, we may do it in a different way. However, comma, if it's required, and, and, and yes, it will be perceived as inconsistent. As a matter of fact, we want it to be perceived as inconsistent. That way the bad person, so if today everybody had to show their ID card and to get through, and tomorrow it didn't, eh, it didn't. But we are still ensuring 100% ID proofing of people going through the vehicle. That is never stopped. We will always maintain a minimum standard of identity, identity proofing individuals coming through. How we do it is completely random. So expect that. The more, the more you tell me, I don't know what to expect when I get to the gate, we are doing our job. Thank you. Well, it, excuse me on that. If you have the proper ID, one thing you can expect is if you have the proper ID that's been vetted, you will get on the installation. Sometimes you might have to, your passenger might have to show his ID card, sometimes you might not. But if you have the appropriate ID, there will never be a time when somebody with a DOD CAT card, you're not gonna get on unless it gets scared. I mean, if, you, if you've done the process, that is consistent, but yes. at the gate, what's being inspected or how we're letting people on might vary just for force protection. All good questions. 
Question in the back. I have a question um, of kind of related to the trusted traveler system. If somebody, if either you're calling for a cab as a resident or if you have a guest coming in a cab, does the cab driver have to be vetted? Are there cab companies that are going to be 100% vetted with their drivers that you know will be allowed on post? What's, what's the procedure for cabs now? Go ahead. For taxis, the taxi drivers do have to be vetted or they are escorted through by the DOD ID card holder. So, well, we can run all kinds of different scenarios. You can do the one, for some reason, you're at home, you have no car, you have no friends, you have no neighbors, and there's no way in any way, shape, or form you can get from your resident, residency to the gate. So, you call an Uber driver or a taxi driver who has not, for whatever reason, been pre-vetted, and they are frustrated cargo at the gate. Depending on the situation, that's where you can call. So, for instance, you have an emergency flight, and, and again, we're going back to, to the myriad of what ifs. 99% of the time, when you call for an Uber driver or taxi driver, they, they are in companies and businesses that know of our procedures and have pre-vetted their drivers. Also, 99% of the time, you can either physically go out to the taxi, or you have someone drive you to the taxi. Some way, shape, or form, you can get to that taxi driver to either A, escort them back to your house to pick up whatever it is in addition to yourself. So 99% of the time, there is no issue. Now we're gonna talk about the exigent circumstance. Again, I am alone, I have no friends, I have no neighbors, I have an emergency flight that I have to catch, there's no way I've got 15 bags with me and I can't walk because I just had my leg operated on. In that circumstance, describe that situation because you will get a call from the gate because the taxi or Uber driver or limo driver will be frustrated cargo at the, at the inspection station. They will call you. They will ask, ma'am, sir, blah, 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 blah. Is this true? Yes. Okay, stand by. They will then call again, like uh, the colonel was saying, I left my ID at the house. You will have to wait. We can't guarantee that the patrol will arrive within five minutes, but you can wait and eventually a patrol. So we have, this whole process is crafted for the 99%. The, the exigent circumstances are just that and will be dealt with on a one by one basis. Because I can't even begin, I mean, I can come up with scenarios all night and they will be dealt with appropriately at the time they have. We are reaching out to as many of the local vendors as we possibly can to let them know, pre-vet your employees, please, so that they can get on Fort Meade. That includes all the taxi companies. There is, you know, the one company at BWI that's got the contract for Fort Meade. Go, Wow, when you're at the airport and you go to the oh, and you go to the cab the stand to get back, back onto the fort, yeah. then you serve as the trusted. The, then the cab driver comes on the installation of the trusted traveler program. Right. You're, I don't know the cab driver, and I'm not sure. <laughs> I, from a security perspective, what if I don't want to? You, if the you're cab in the cab and you are a DOD ID card holder or a holder of a type of Fort Meade uh, issued credential allowing you access onto the installation you are in effect escorting the cab driver. So now, I, I'm trying to understand, do you want the cab driver to come through or you do not want them to come through? What, what they, about when you leave? No, no, when they're here, they, 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 walk, when they, they walk, walk. And then the, the, okay, she gets in the cab, they get on post, she's the, the plus D, okay? They drop them off. Now this cab driver goes and plants a bomb, boom, 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 whatever. That's, I think she's trying to say, what happens, how are you sponsoring that? person, once you are dropped off at your resident, you are, are you still responsible for that person as he or she leaves the installation? So, as it stands right now, if you're saying you have a concern about the taxi driver going through, we have these things called license plate readers. We know when vehicles come on the installation. If, for instance, you have just described the nightmare scenario and something happens, are we going to be going to her to answer for what the cab driver did? Now, I will be honest, in any sort of investigation, we will find out, well, who was the last person to be? Are we going to throw her in hand irons and take her down to the station? No, no, but just be expected. Just like 
the Paris and Taxi and the Belgian Taxi. The cab driver, did they hold that cab driver responsible? No, but they did interview them. So it, it's interview. But again, we're describing the, the nightmare what if scenario. Yeah. So, so again, so, so let's, again, you know, bring it back. Um, we're going to reach out to the cab companies. We're going to request th that they pre-vet their employees so that we don't have to worry about this. Uh, if you are at the taxi you know, stand and, and, you, and, you know, well, I mean, if you're not comfortable <laughs> with the taxi, you know, the tribe, then I wouldn't, you know, recommend not getting in the cab in the first place. But if you're, you know, if you're okay with that, you then, uh, you know, are able to serve. I've done this myself, you know, uh, a handful of times already. Uh, you serve as the trustee. If, right, I mean, if that cab driver then does, chooses to do something bad on the installation on the way out, right, I'm not going to prosecute you if that person was a cab driver that came on here. My point was just whether, whether we could sponsor an unvetted cab driver. So that's yeah, it's, again, it goes to the trusted traveler program. Right, you're either coming on as the quote unquote either escort or trusted traveler, because that is a special, that's what we're, we're doing that today. There's no change to the taxi policy at all. That's what we're doing today. Okay. Yeah. No. So, ma'am, and I, I think back to your one question about is there anything we can do to let you know what cab companies are vetted? We can absolutely do that. We have a community portion on the Fort Meade website, but we'll also put it in our insert that's coming out next Thursday. It is where you can go to get a list of approved vendors. Now, it might, it might be a building list. As, companies come on, but uh, we could certainly work to keep an updated list of cab companies that have gone through the process of being vetted. You know, we can choose or not choose to get their employees vetted as they see fit, but, um, you know, if they want to do business on Fort Meade, it would behoove them to, uh, to do that because really it's the, you know, it's the delivery drivers uh, are the ones that really have to be pre-vetted ahead of time. All of the, uh, you know, U.S. Postal Service, the, uh, the, um, uh, UPS drivers, the FedEx drivers, they all know. They have circuits, the cable company uh, that services us, they know that their employees need to be pre-vetted and they're, uh, you know, hopeful as I can be it, they're going to comply uh, to that. So, Nick? They would. If you get in the cab, it's like, by the way, do you happen to have a Fort Meade access badge? No, you don't. Okay, well, this is going to be a rough ride. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, so, so, both me and my husband's family comes out periodically to visit, and they're coming from the West Coast. And if I'm not mistaken, half of our family is coming from a state whose driver's license is not in compliance. So can you expand a little bit on how the pre-vetting process works? 12 different forms of ID that the Real ID Act will accept. Well, I mean, there are four states, I think, left in the United States that have not come in compliance with the Real ID Act, but it's, a, it's not just the state's driver's license. It's a total of 12 different forms of identification that can be used. Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, I was just going to say, so would we go to the visitor center, pick up the paperwork, fill it out, and then bring it back with the with their ID information? You have to have at least one piece of ID that is real ID act. To pick it up, but you don't have to, you don't, we have the information about what forms of identification are in the, the, the real ID act out on the website. So you don't have to go to the, the VCC to pick up that information and then go you know, home to get it and then go back to the VCC. Okay. Go online and, and, and look up the, okay. The, the types of identification that uh, are covered under the Real ID Act, and then so you know, and you can you know ask your parents for the information on the uh, forms of ID that are covered. Uh, so yeah. Yes, ma'am. So when we pre-vet so pre family that's coming to, or friends who are coming to visit. They don't have to have, we don't have to go with their IDs. Not their uh, IDs. You just need the information. You need the information and your identification. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Once somebody has their pass, would they need to, um, so the person 
first time, they either go to the visitor center and pick up their pass, or they go and then go through the inspection lane. The second time they come visit, also through the inspection lane or just through the gate? Inspection lane. Okay. We will tell you whether or not you need to go through the inspection lane. Okay. Just be prepared. Expect you will go through the expect inspection lane. And if you, you know, and the pass is a paper pass, right? So if you lose it or the dog eats it, you're going to have to get another one. And they don't have an expedited line at the BCC for a dog eat on that? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> dog chewing line is to the left. <laughs> you want? What? So, we will have, again, as mentioned, we're recording this, so please let your friends and anybody know who has, uh, who has a need to come onto the fort, that this information will be out there. We also have frequently asked questions on the website. There's a nice little link you click, you can click on it. And then next Thursday, sound off, we will have an eight page insert that will get into more details about what the Real ID Act is, what do you do if you're a resident, what does it mean to be an escort and your responsibilities, and, and that type of information uh, will be readily available and online as well. And we thank you for your cooperation and patience as we uh, implement this final measure uh, of those that the Army has now uh, determined prudent to implement across all Army forts in, uh, uh, in the colony of the United States. So thanks for being here tonight, and uh, we'll see you soon.